Hello. Hello. I'm good. How are you? Great. Okay, great. Um, so I will be asking you a few questions. This is for our IGTV, so I'm just going to go through a quick introduction for everyone who's watching, and then we can get started with the questions. So we will be conducting a short interview with you about your policies and motivations to run for um, the House of Representatives in Kansas, and we will post it on our IGTV channel. And Youth for Joe Biden is a grassroots organization that focuses on mo mobilizing young voters to turn out and vote. And one of our initiatives is to interview politicians in order to show our members what a career or involvement in politics can look like. So for our first question, um, what motivated you to run for the Kansas House of Representatives? And also you can introduce yourself during this question. Yeah, me today. My name is Christina Haswood. I'm a candidate for the Kansas House of Representatives in District 10, which is the Southeast County of um, Douglas County, um, down to Lawrence, Kansas, down into Baldwin City, Kansas. And we have about almost 24,000, a little over in our population. And of course, that's going to change with the 2020 census. If you haven't done it yet, do it now. And I am currently a Democrat. I won my three-way primary. I'm currently running unopposed in the general. And that's a little bit about me. Oh, I'm Native American as well, which is a very important indigenous woman from the Navajo Nation. So I am what you call an urban Indian. And kind of my motivation to run, there's a lot of factors that went into um, just running for office. My background is in public health. I just recently graduated my master's in public health from the University of Kansas Medical Center. Um, previously got my bachelor's of science in public health from Arizona State University. Got my associate's of science in community health from Haskell Nations University. And that all in the span took about eight years. So the four, four years of college did not happen for me and never give up. Um, but it was just... I was into health policy, um, American Indian Alaska Native health policy is what it's called in the research and um, policy area. And I was really frustrated when I wanted to advocate for the urban people because a lot of American Indian policy is made around tribal sovereignty. There's over 576 federally recognized tribes, I believe, somewhere around that number. And all the legislation they would pass at the federal level involve tribal lands and for someone like me and a lot of us young indigenous peoples that you know grew up off the reservation or come up off the reservation to go to college that treaty rights that our ancestors survived genocide for seem to not carry over once you cross your tribal boundary lines um so i would try to advocate to congress the men and women as well as their staffers when i had internships in dc and you have about 30 minutes with the staffers or with Congress. And that first 15 minutes was just giving a Native American history lesson 101 back to 1492. And it was extremely frustrating because we could not get to any of the issues. And you wonder why Indian country is behind on all these issues. Um, it's because we're having to give history lessons. And this wasn't a new thing for me because even in higher education and college, going to the, one of the biggest schools, Arizona State, and then going to the University of Kansas Medical Center at the master's level of higher education, I am still giving this history lesson to the whole classroom. And I asked my teachers, okay, you know, in health policy, especially at the master's level, where a lot of us are going to be directors of health centers or we're going to be supervisors in these leadership positions because we took that extra step to get our MPH, um, our instructors really didn't know much about the tribal systems. Um, so I would always think, man, I really wish we could get some elected official to know about our tribal history. And then I was like, who knows? And then you would think, I would think of everybody else except, you know, myself or another one of us. And when I started to get involved in local politics with my current state representative, Representative Eileen Horn, um, she wasn't seeking re-election, but um, she has endorsed me to take her spot and she was the first person of elected officials I reached out to and I went to she had Saturday morning coffee shops at one of my favorite local coffee shops in town and I went there on a Saturday morning 9 a.m. Um, trying to figure out uh, what she was about because 
my preconceived notion of politicians is that they don't care about us and you know they're in it for whatever benefit benefits them and i was pleased to find out that she had such a great heart um, her leadership style was really great and she always was wanting to improve um, her knowledge base especially with native americans in the lawrence district 10 area in my district we native americans are actually um, the third second highest race um, it goes like white caucasians hispanics of all races and american indians which is pretty large for a district in Kansas. So I really wanted to highlight that. And when she wasn't seeking reelection, I actually got a call at like 9 p.m. on a Thursday. I just got finished doing my homework, writing a paper, and the Native American caucus chair of the Kansas Democrats called me asking, you're from District 10, right? I was like, yes. She goes, do you want to run? I was like, are you crazy? <laughs> I still need to finish the grad school. She goes, you know, you can run the, you know, the election filing date is June 1st. Um, the primary will be August 4th. You'd be all set to go. And of course I asked my family and my friends and representative Eileen Horn, I got to talk to her. And she pretty much said that, what do you have to lose? You know, you, <laughs> um, you don't have, you know, you're young and you have great ideas and you're from this community. Just I was born and raised here in Lawrence and I grew up in District 10 my entire life. I'm a proud product of the K-12 school systems here. I'm qualified enough as it is. Having that master's degree and my experience, I've gotten experience at all levels of government, health policy. I've done about almost 10 internships in my whole eight years of higher education. Um, I'm qualified and currently with the pandemic, we need public health leadership now more than ever. Yeah, I mean, it's really great that you're getting involved and congratulations on winning the primary. That's really important. <laughs> um, yeah. so our second question is, since you have experience in public health, like you talked about, how will you transfer your knowledge over to this position? So I started to run, it was probably about May, and that's when COVID-19 really impacted Kansas. Um, and we can see now that Kansas is currently a red state and there's a lot of cases happening um, here at my county level. We were doing a pretty good job and I think we kind of let our guard down a bit. And we even, I think the New York Times even covered Douglas County, Lawrence, Kansas, saying that they're doing such a great job. And then of course, a couple of weeks later, we had a spike in cases. And it really just goes to show that we really can't ease up on COVID-19. And then the state politics, um, what was currently happening is our governor, Governor Kelly, was trying to implement public health measures and she has these task forces of public health expertise, even with my previous school, um, University of Kansas Medical Center. There's a bunch of public health experts helping her out every day to make these decisions. And she was listening to them and really looking at the data. I strongly believe that we need to make data form evidence-based decisions and we can't wait a week or two um, to make these public health measures because that's a lot of time for COVID to, to catch. It takes about 14 days to show any signs and symptoms, even five days at minimum. And you know, this all comes from personal experience being Navajo. The Navajo Nation has the highest cases and mortalities and morbidities of COVID-19 um, that really isn't highlighted much about the media. And I think they're really collecting data on tribal lands. So right now, when you see COVID-19, it's just the states. And my family has personally been impacted by COVID-19, um, or one of my family members has passed from it. So it's creeped into my personal life. And just seeing all my family on the reservation, just like it, just the fear of it. And you just never know, are you going to get it, you know, at Walmart or you know, at the laundromat. Um, I don't want that to happen to my community. I love my state, I love my community. And if we have the time and we have the resources to make these informed decisions and the way that things have been played out here in the state of Kansas is um, Governor Kelly has been met with challenges saying that she's overstepping her boundaries of control when they were met with good intentions, such as trying to put a mask mandate for the state of Kansas. Um, unfortunately, they said that she was overstepping her boundaries of a governor and it's been 
decide, being decided now at the local levels are, this was about a couple weeks ago that it was being voted in on and some local governments didn't even hold a vote at all or let public comments in. And COVID-19 is not going to stop at your county borders because you don't have a mask mandate. Um, and it really just goes to show, and here in my community too, we have the University of Kansas, which is another big state, uh, another big college. Um, we have Baker University in Baldwin City. We have Haskell Nations University in the district. And we're a college town, so now we're really facing the, the urgency of now all these college kids are moving into town. Um, and you know, they like to be social. And we as a town have been sacrificing so much of staying at home. Our bars and our restaurants have suffered. Many local businesses and mom and pop shops have closed down. Employment's at an all time high and furlough as well. Yeah, it's great to see that you're so passionate about this. I think that's very important. Um, our next question is, what are some of your ideas to increase and encourage Native American representation in Kansas and in American politics in general? That's a personal big one for me. And that was one of those, thing, those things that when I was running, um, when I got involved in the local politics, it was actually pretty recently, about a year and a year and a half ago. And when I started going to these legislative talks with my representatives and state representatives here at the local level, um, and even when I could catch my congressman, he's very good at that. <laughs> um, I would look around at who all these people from the community were, and most of the time I'd be the only person of color, the only young person there, the only Native American, almost all the time. And you know that list can go on and on and on, um, just the lack of representation that was there. And then that really opened my eyes to the amount of privilege it is to even meet your representative. You know, if you're just the average person, you're probably going to be working the weekends, and you probably have not one kid, but two kids, maybe three kids. And then taking the current circumstances of you know one of the big issues is broadband. When you're working from home and you have multiple kids getting on Zoom classes, do you have the bandwidth to support that? Um, and that's a lot of challenges, not only here in the urban area, but in the agricultural rural area as well. It's even more, more of an urgency to, to make those type of decisions to um, include them as well. And I really hope that my campaign has at least inspired young indigenous peoples um, that we belong in these positions because for the longest time, I didn't believe that my voice mattered. Um, representation matters to me the most because when I saw Representative Punkley Victors here in the representative in Wichita, it really opened my eyes because she was working on a missing murder indigenous woman's bill for Kansas. And I caught wind of it and actually kind of skips Get, skip class <laughs> to go to the Capitol and witness history. Um, and she had a press conference and she asked all of us, you know, wear red because that's the color of bringing awareness to Miss Humor Indigenous Women. And then she asked us all to get behind her because, you know, not only are we making this legislation to protect, um, you know, our sisters and our mothers, um, but, you know, we're moving forward and trying to make these types of steps of changes. And even when Congresswoman Sharice Davids won in Kansas, that really opened my eyes to, we can, we can really do this. And you know, when you look at who represents us here in Kansas, I don't think it represents the community at all. So I really encourage not only indigenous peoples, but other peoples of color. If you're from the LGBTQ plus community, um, we really need your voice out here, and there is enough room for you here. <laughs> Please don't make me be here by myself, because <laughs> you can do it. And, you know, as long as you have, you know, the passion for your community, and, you know, you have a good head on your shoulders and the support of your community, because I always try to get input of my community. And one of the biggest things when in my primary is we made a lot of calls to voters, and that was one of the most favorite thing about my campaign experience is getting to talk to voters of their personal experience. Everyone knows the policies that they want to hear about, but when you get to 
know somebody at a personal level and how does this policy really impact you? And, you know, I've actually got to talk to a voter one time about the foster care system, which there's a lot of issues that don't make it to the website or make it to a forum. Um, doesn't mean that they're not important at all, um, but I ha like to have this one-on-one -on -one moment um, with voters to hear their personal experience. And it just has a lot of weight to it too, um, instead of reading it in a newspaper or on an online article. Yeah, I think representation is really important in politics, and it's great that you're so um, passionate about that and you want to work for that. Um, so our next question is, for many youth, climate change and the climate crisis is a really important issue. What are your plans to combat the climate crisis and for climate change in general? Has a lot of improvement to do with the climate crisis um, and climate change. And I'm very fortunate enough to have a good handful of endorsements. Um, there was a recent bill passed, I believe, last legislative session that formally recognized that Kansas is in the climate crisis of climate change. And about, I think, a good five or six of those representatives who wrote the bill, Representative Rishu, I got his endorsement and he's been a great mentor to me. Um, I got other, you know, like Representative Pankwe Victors was on that bill, Representative Brandon Woodward was on that bill, Representative Nancy Lusk. Um, those people have endorsed me. So not only am I having this great support of, um, of legis current state legislatures waiting for me on day one in January, but who have helped me through the process too um, of learning more of these issues and where is Kansas at and where do we need to grow at? And not only is climate change an issue um, just for, for us young people, but it's Kansas is an agricultural state and the farmers and ranchers are really feeling the changes as well, um, especially with, with water and wind, um, creating and building more sustainable energy. Kansas has the mo a good potential of wind energy as well. And if we really invest in that, we could power power majority of the state by 2030. I believe it was about 100% if we like really just put, put the pedal to the metal on that one. And not only if we invest in the wind energy, we would bring jobs and then we would need someone to not only create the equipment, but to maintain the equipment. And then that could be a whole nother program into college and the management of that. Um, so I really want to not only bring all these great ideas that are in motion, but also my indigenous knowledge as well. I grew up in a, a holistic health perspective of being a Diné woman. And, you know, we have this special relationship with Mother Earth. And for the longest time, this is, you know, this is how I grew up. But then when I got to college in the textbook, it's called holistic health. Um, <laughs> so what was really interesting and like in, in our language in Diné, we call it hajo. And it means, it's just one little word that's like four letters, but it means to be at peace with your physical body, with the environment around your mental health and your spiritual health, giving gratitude um, to, you know, to, to creator and whoever your creator is. Um, and I'm just excited to bring that type of perspective. And, you know, we have four fairly recognized tribes here in Kansas, and they fight with water rights as well and I believe at one point they even the water got so bad that they had to advise their tribal members not to hunt or fish on the land and you know there's something really wrong when you tell indigenous peoples not to do what they've been doing for thousands and millions of years so I'm just excited to bring this perspective um, I have also been endorsed by the Sunrise Movement of Lawrence, Kansas, who has been a big powerhouse in my campaign. Um, they have been just absolutely crushing it. I'm in the phone banks in my primary, and I look forward to that great partnership with them, as well as Kansas uh, Youth for Climate Action um, down in Wichita, Kansas as well. They have been a great support system of mine, and I'm so glad to not only have the advice of um, more seasoned folks, but also the young folks who are in college and high school because you guys are the future. And I want to not only save 
as much as we can with Mother Earth, but also to to leave it and give it to you guys after after we are, I guess, not here anymore. And, you know, for the future generations, for my grandchildren and their grandchildren as well. Yeah, um, so finally, speaking of like the young voters, how do you plan to engage young voters in this election and in upcoming elections? So um, campaigning in a pandemic has pushed us to social media um, now more than ever. And that's really nothing new to me. I'm 26 years old and I like to think I'm pretty hip with the, the times. <laughs> but I found out that to be a little bit more difficult when we went on to TikTok. And luckily, um, once we got this young group of support, um, we started to hire on a field organizer. And she graduated from the high school I graduated from. And she's only 19 years old. And she managed to get over 50 volunteers for my phone banking. Um, we didn't have a lot of funds, too. Um, being 26, I don't have the professional connections as many more older politicians have. Um, but I believe that was one of our biggest reasons for winning my primary um, by 70% of the vote. And then we also got to hire on a um, Kansas high school um, Democrat who he really took over my TikTok. If you look through it, I, I tried <laughs> in the first couple of videos, but when things really started picking up, he had like the greatest ideas. Um, just to really amplify my voice. And with that, we actually reach engagement across the world. And I even got an email from a young woman who I think was from, from KU, a student from KU, asking from South Korea, how can I help with your campaign? Um, I hope someone got back to her because I didn't know how she could help from across the world. But it was just ex it really just put into perspective of how much it is just to not only do a good job here, but to show others and young people, you know, my face, my beautiful brown skin and my brown hair and my beaded earrings that, you know, we belong in these positions. And for the longest times, I didn't think I belonged here. And we really need our voices heard at the table because there's a lot of, other marginalized communities too that need to be at the table as well. Um, we have another great Native American candidate in Kansas. Her name is Stephanie Byers, um, who is from the Chickasaw Nation. And she, if she um, beats her Republican opponent, which I think most likely she will, she would be the first trans Native American Kansan in the state legislature. So there's a lot of firsts that still needs to happen. And I really, Hope that I reach a lot of youth and if anybody has any questions feel free to reach out on my DMs. Um, I'm pretty active on there. Yeah that's great. Um, when you mentioned TikTok we actually found your campaign through there so it's definitely really working. Um, those were all the questions we have so far. Um, thank you for <laughs> joining us. It was really great to hear from you and we will be posting this IGTV probably in this week for you to like repost and like um, see like what um, the interview was much for your time. I, I really enjoyed this. Thank you. Have a nice day too. You too. Bye.